Hey guys, how's it going? This is going to be a commentary or an expository study on 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Now, I will say that most of what I'm going to be reading is commentary from Albert Barnes. I really don't know a whole lot about him, except for I did learn that I don't believe that he's a Calvinist, and I like a lot of his commentary. I found, at least in this chapter, that he goes into a lot of detail and brings up a lot of good points. And sometimes he writes too much, I think, in stuff that's not necessary, so I cut it down a lot. I've also used commentary from other people, uh, you know, it's all in the public domain, and I use a website, mostly uh, from a website called Study Light, and um, I also use sermon audio and listen to a lot of different sermons. So uh, that's how I put together some of my studies, and that's how I did this one. And, you know, there's some of my own words, too. Um, so, anyways, I'll go ahead and read 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And it says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with, with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Now I'm just going to go over each verse one by one and do some commentary on them. So we start with, uh, the first five verses or so, uh, you know, there's kind of broken down into a few different sections in this chapter, and um, so for the first five verses or so, we're going to talk about proclaiming Christ crucified. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, or yes, chapter 2, verse 1, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. First, Paul says here, I and I, brethren, he addresses the people who he's speaking to as brethren. He's speaking to this church in Corinth. He's keeping up the tender and affectionate style of address. And when he came unto them, you can read about this in Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 10. This is probably the time that he was speaking of when he came to Corinth. He came not with excellency of speech. That rhetorical refinement or those subtle philosophical discussions which were admired by the Greeks. He came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, of the wisdom of this world is what he's speaking of, of that kind of wisdom which was sought and cultivated in Greece. But he came declaring the testimony of God, which is the gospel, and referred to previously as the testimony of Christ in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 6. Therefore, Christ is God. So this is a great proof of the deity of Christ that he previously refers to the gospel as the testimony of Christ. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, refers to it as the testimony of God. And we see this a lot throughout Scripture. Um, you know, 
just like, you know, the judgment seat of Christ, you know, and, and God is, you know, the judge. So uh, we see that Christ is God. Uh, lots of other examples, uh, they escape my mind right now, but I've done, you know, studies on the deity of Christ. Um, I know there's some there. Um, you know, also, like, we got the Holy Spirit is referenced to as the Spirit of God, but then it's also referenced as the Spirit of Christ. And so you see that those things are interchangeable, not meaning that Christ is the Father, but meaning that Christ is deity. Okay, they are three distinct persons in one being. So anyways, let's continue. Uh, not a whole lot in there. Uh, it's pretty to the point. Uh, and you know, I mean, I learned a lot from the study, and I hope that you'll learn a lot, because some of these verses, they get controversial and stuff, and there's different viewpoints, and there's things that, you know, I didn't understand correctly that as I studied more, I think became more clear to me. With the help of these commentaries, you know, and the help of God, obviously. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. So Paul's number one concern when coming to Corinth was to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it said that he was determined not to know, which means to attend to or be engaged in or regard. I resolved not to give my time and attention while among you to the laws and traditions of the Jews, to your orators, philosophers, and poets, to the beauty of your architecture or statuary, to a contemplation of your customs and laws, but to attend to this only, making known the cross of Christ. Paul says that he designed that this should be the only thing on which his mind should be fixed, the only subject of his attention, the only object thereupon which he sought that knowledge should be diffused. He said that uh, he was determined not to know anything among them. Anything means anything while he was with them. Okay. Um, you know, so again, his, his number one concern, his main point was to preach the cross, the gospel, the testimony of God. Save Jesus Christ, which means accept Jesus Christ. This is the only thing of which I propose to have any knowledge among you, and him crucified, to maintain the doctrine that the Messiah was to be crucified for the sins of the world, and that he who had been crucified was in fact the Messiah. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3. And I was with you in weakness, and in fear, and in much trembling. And here I think is more one of the first ones where um, there seems to be some different views in the commentaries. And um, so anyways... He said, and I was with you. Paul continued there at least a year and six months. We can see in Acts 18.11. And here's the thing. He was with them in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. What does that mean? Well, we see that these phrases are kind of used a handful of other times in Scripture. It's used uh, back in Psalms chapter or Psalm 2.11. We see it says, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. So there we see, you know, serving the Lord with fear and rejoicing with trembling. And uh, Paul used this phrase a few different times in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. It says, And his inward aff affection is more abundant toward you, whilst he remembereth the obedience of you all, how with fear and trembling you received him. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart as unto Christ. And uh, in Romans chapter 11, verse 20, he says, Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith, be not high-minded, but fear. So we see this contrast between being high-minded and fear. Here the whole context shows that he refers to his state of mind. He contrasts weakness with excellency of words in verse 1. Okay, In verse 1 it said, And brethren, I could... Uh, wait, it's, it's not. In verse 1 it says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of, of God. But he did come in weakness. 
And therefore he joins it with fear and trembling, which are companions of true modesty. Not such fear and trembling as terrify the conscience, but such as are contrary to vanity and pride, implying the utmost care and diligence, respect and reverence. It was not in the consciousness of strength, self-confident and self-relying that he had appeared among them, but as oppressed with a sense of his weakness and insufficiency. He had a work to do which he felt to be entirely above his powers, and fear and trembling, and anxiety and solicitude of mind arising out of a sense of his insufficiency and of the infinite importance of his work. And so some people, when they read this, they says, you know, and I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And so they might think he was saying that he was physically, he was physically weak, he was physically trembling, he was scared. You know, some commentaries say that, uh, you know, maybe he was weak and in fear because of persecution or because of the rough labor that he did or whatever. But I think that's completely ignoring the context here. And so it has to do with the state of mind. It has to do more with a reverence towards God, okay? Uh, not so much a fear out of, you know, like a fear of judgment, but like a fear of not being pleasing to God, you know, a fear as in respect, as in loving God, and uh, wanting to do right by Him. And He came in weakness, you know, when He's proclaiming these things, you know, it's not of His own strength, but it's, it's of the Lord. So, you know, it's kind of figurative in a way, it's a phrase, and I say that things are figurative a lot, and they are, and that's just the way that it is. So, don't think of a, you know, literal physical weakness and fear and trembling here. No, it has to do with, you know, how he delivered it. He delivered it with reverence, with humility, okay, not being proud and boastful, and, um, you know, not of, you know, his own wisdom or whatever. This is the wisdom of God that he was proclaiming. So let's go on to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. And so at the beginning we see, he says, and my speech and my preaching, which, you know, preaching is speech in a way. So it could be that he means my speech in private as well as my public preaching, you know. Uh, he's saying, you know, all of everything that he spoke here, was not with persuasive words of hu human wisdom, such as the wise men of the world use, but with the demonstration of the spirit and of power. With that powerful kind of demonstration, which flows from the Holy Spirit, which works on the conscience, with the most convincing light and the most persuasive evidence. But in demonstration, in the showing or in the testimony of evidence which the Spirit produced, the meaning is that the Spirit furnished the evidence of the divine origin of the religion which he preached, and that it did not depend for its proof on his own reasonings or eloquence. The proof, the demonstration which the Spirit furnished, was undoubtedly the miracles which were performed, the gift of tongues, and the remarkable conver conversions which attended the gospel. The word Spirit here refers doubtless to the Holy Spirit. And Paul says that this spirit had furnished demonstration of the divine origin of the nature of the gospel. This had been by the gift of tongues and by the effects of his agency in renewing and sanctifying the heart. End of power, that is the power of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5. In the next verse, we see that uh, the divine power and efficacy which attended the preaching of the gospel there. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5 says, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. The effect of the gospel is the evidence to which the apostle appeals for its truth. So let's talk about some of the evidence of the gospel. One, in the conversion of sinners to God of all classes, ages, and conditions when all human means of reforming them was vain. That's some powerful evidence of the gospel is the conversion of sinners when all human means of reforming them was vain. And we have obviously the conversion of Paul, which is a great evidence. Number two, and it's giving them peace, joy, and happiness, and, and it's transforming their lives. And, you know, 
I experienced that in my own conversion, you know, before I got saved, I had a lot of nights where I couldn't even sleep at night, you know, thinking about the things that I've done and just the way that my life was going. And after I got saved, I found peace. And making them different people, and making the drunkard sober, the thief honest, the licentious pure, the profane reverent, the indolent industrious, the harsh and the harsh and unkind, gentle and kind, and the wretched happy. Complete lifestyle conversions we see here. And it's diffusing a mild and pure influence over the laws of customs uh, of society and in promoting human happiness everywhere. And think about all the, you know, the hospitals and um, all of the charities and stuff to the homeless and to the needy that, that Christians have done throughout time. And all the great works that, you know, the church has done on earth is evidence of the gospel, the power of God. It's evidence of the power of God that's in the gospel. And in regard to this evidence, number one, that is a kind of evidence which anyone may examine and which no one can deny. It does not need labored, abstruse argumentation, but it is everywhere in society. Every man has witnessed the effects of the gospel in reforming the vicious. No one can deny that it has this power. Number two, it is a mighty display of the power of God. There is no more striking exhibition of his power over mind than in a revival of religion. There is nowhere more manifest demonstration of his presence than when, in such a revival, the proud are humbled, the profane are awed, the blasphemer is silenced, and the pro prolificate and the abandoned and the moral are converted unto God and are led as lost sinners to the same cross and find the same peace. The gospel has thus evidenced from age to age, that it is from God. Every converted sinner furnishes such a demonstration, and every instance where it produces peace, hope, joy, shows that it is from heaven. Now, in the 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So here we go, we're talking about the power of God. Uh, it was more specific here. Uh, we know that in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, what I just read, it talks about, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. And then in verse 5, we see that he's talking about the power of God. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That is your faith. That is your belief of the divine origin of the Christian religion. Should not stand, should not rest upon this, or be sustained by this. God intended to furnish you a firm and solid demonstration that the religion which you embraced was from Him. And this could not be if its preaching had been attended with the graces of eloquence or the abstractions of refined metaphysical reasoning. It would then appear to rest upon human wisdom. But it is in the power of God. The power was seen in changing the heart, in overcoming the strong propensities of our nature to sin and subduing the soul and making the sinner a new creature in Christ Jesus. Every Christian has thus in his own experience he or has this in his own experience sir. he has the fullest proof that he loves God, that he is different from what he once was and that all this has been accomplished by the religion of the cross. The blind man was made to see by the Savior John chapter 10 might have been wholly unable to tell how his eyes were opened, and unable to meet all the cavils of those who might doubt it, or all the subtle and cunning objections of s physiologists. But one thing he certainly could not doubt, that whereas he was blind, he then saw. John chapter 10, verse 25. A man may have no doubt that the sun shines, that the wind blows, that the tides rise, that the blood flows in his veins, that the flowers bloom, and that this could not be except it was from God. While he may have no power to explain these facts, and no power to meet the objections and cavils of those who might choose to embarrass him, so people may know that their hearts are changed, and so it is on this ground that no small part of the Christian world, as in everything else, depend for the most satisfactory evidence of their religion. On this ground, humble and unlearned Christians have often willing to go to the stake as martyrs, just as a humble and unlearned 
patriot is willing to die for his country. He loves it. He is willing to die for it. A Christian loves his God and Savior and is willing to die for his sake. Uh, that's very powerful. Amen. Kind of going on to a second section in this chapter here, Wisdom from the Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. He says, Howbeit. Uh, this commences the second head or argument in this chapter, in which Paul shows that if human wisdom is missing in his preaching, it is not devoid of true and solid and even divine wisdom. He says, We speak wisdom. We do not admit that we utter foolishness. We have spoken of the foolishness of preaching in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 21 and of the estimate in which it was held by the world, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 22 through 28, and of our own manner among you as not laying claim to human learning or eloquence, but we do not design to admit that we have been really speaking folly. We have been uttering that which is truly wise, but which is seen and understood by such only by those who are qualified to judge, by those who may be denominated perfect, that is, those who are suited by God to understand it. By wisdom here, the apostle means the system of truth, which he had explained and defended the plan of salvation by the cross of Christ. He says, among them that are perfect, and this is something that, you know, sinless perfection people could take out of context and abuse this verse but perfect here is evidently applied to Christians, as it is in Philippians 3.15, Let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded. And it is clearly used to denote those who are advanced in Christian knowledge, who are qualified to understand the subject, who had made progress in the knowledge of the mysteries of the gospel, and who thus saw, it, saw its excellence. It does not mean that they were sinless, for the argument of the apostle does not bear on that inquiry. But they were qualified to understand the gospel in contradistinction from the gross, the sensual, and the carnally minded who rejected it as foolishness. There is perhaps here an allusion to the pagan mysteries where those who had been fully initiated were said to be perfect, fully instructed in those rites and doctrines, and if so, then this passage means that those only who have been fully instructed in the knowledge of the Christian religion will be qualified to see its beauty and its wisdom. The gross and sensual do not see it, and those only who are enlightened by the Holy Spirit are qualified to appreciate its beauty and excellency. Not the wisdom of the world, not that which this world has originated or loved, nor the princes of the world. Perhaps Intending chiefly here the rulers of the Jews, see 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8. They neither devised it, nor loved it, nor saw its wisdom. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8. And, uh, you know, their wisdom comes to naught. Uh, that is, whose plans fail, uh, whose wisdom vanishes, and who themselves, with all their pomp and splendor, come to nothing in the grave. Compare Isaiah 14. All the plans of human wisdom shall fail, and this which is originated by God only shall stand. So, let's continue on to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. We speak, we who have preached the gospel, the wisdom of God. We teach or proclaim the wise plan of God for the salvation of people, we make known the divine wisdom in regard to the scheme of human redemption. This plan was of God and in opposition to other plans which were of human beings. In a mystery, even the hidden wisdom. So it says, in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, uh, we can understand this as we proclaim the divine wisdom hidden in a mystery. The divine wisdom that's hidden in a mystery. The apostle does not say that their preaching was mysterious, which is how some people may take this, nor that their doctrine was unintelligible, but it refers to the fact that this wisdom had been hidden in a mystery from people until that time, but was then revealed by the gospel. In other words, he does not say that when they declared uh, that what they then declared was hidden in a mystery, but that they made known the divine wisdom which had been concealed from the minds of people. That this mystery had been revealed to Christians by the Spirit of God proves 
he does not here refer to that which is in itself unintelligible. Because we read later in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. The apostle, the apostle has here especially in view the all-wise counsel of God for the salvation of people by Jesus Christ in the writings of the Old Testament only obscurely signified and to the generality of people utterly unknown, which God ordained, which plan, so full of wisdom, God appointed in his own purpose before the foundation of the world. That is, it was a plan which from eternity he determined to execute. It was not a new device. It had not been got up to serve an occasion, but it was a plan laid deep in the eternal counsel of God and on which he had his eyes forever fixed. And this passage proves that God had a plan, and that this plan was eternal. And then I put the redemption of mankind through the sacrifice of his son Jesus Christ, the salvation of those who believe him, which is what we're talking about. God ordaining. Uh, then again, any time when you know, anything's mentioned about God ordaining anything, Calvinists will use that in the wrong way. Uh, but there's more of a Calvinist main proof text that I'll go over later, which I think I've already went over in the past, but I'll focus more on that when we get to that. Unto our glory, in order that we might be honored and, or glorified, this may refer either to the honor which was put upon Christians in this life and being admitted to the privileges of the sons of God, or more probably to that eternal weight of glory which remains for them in heaven. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. One design of the plan was to raise the redeemed to glory and honor and immortality. It should greatly increase our gratitude, our gratitude to God that it was subject of eternal design that he always has cherished this purpose and that he has loved us with such love and sought our happiness and salvation with such intensity that in order to accomplish it, accomplish it he was willing to give his own son to die on a cross. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Which, we're talking about the wisdom, uh, the strongest proof of the natural man's destitution of heavenly wisdom. The princes of this world, Herod, Pilate, Annas, and Cephas, represented the worldly great in church and state, philosophers and Rhetoricians. Rhetoricians. Um, crucified the Lord of Glory. This is one of the main things in this verse that I would like to point out. The Lord of Glory or the Glorious Jehovah. I've talked about this before in my um, Deity of Christ videos. One of them, the titles of Deity. The Lord of Glory is the title of Deity that's given to Jesus Christ. Um, so the Lord of Glory or the Glorious Jehovah uh, as reference seems to be had to Psalm 24-7, where he is called the King of Glory. This is an argument of his true and proper deity. He is so called because possessed of all glorious perfections and is the brightness of his Father's glory. The same honor and glory are due to him as to the Father, and the same ascriptions of glory are made to him by angels and men. And so um, it's also interesting, this is implying the inseparable connection of Christ's humanity and his divinity, uh, which he had known in his right before the world was, um, the glory that he had with the Father. Um, we read about John 17.4 and 17.24, that same Lord who, had the, who shared the glory with his Father before the world was, was crucified. So that's speaking of his humanity. And the Son has the Father's title, comprehending all the fullness of the Godhead. So we got another proof of the deity of Christ here. We had first the testimony of God, which he was speaking of, you know, the testimony of Christ um, previously. So we get the deity of Christ out of that, and we get it out of the title of the Lord of Glory in verse 8. Let's continue on to verse 9. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. This is another interesting verse. And any times we see that it is written, he's usually uh, quoting from the Old Testament. And here he's quoting from Isaiah 64, 4. 
For since the beginning of the world men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for them that waiteth for him. It is not quoted literally, but the sense only is given. Paul had in his eye the passage in Isaiah and intended to apply it to his present purpose. These words are not here meant to refer to the future life, which I think is interesting because I've used them that way before, and I know a lot of people will use this verse, take it out of context, and use it to refer to the future life. When it says, I have not seen, ear had, or, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. So we think that it's speaking of heaven. We think that it's speaking of the life to come, the future. It's not. Okay, it's not a descriptive state of the blessed in heaven. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, the next verse states that God has already revealed these things to Christians by his spirit. So it cannot be speaking of that which is yet to come. It is to prove that those who are Christians have views of that which the eyes of other people have not seen, a view of wisdom and fitness and beauty which can be found in no other plan. It is true that this view is attended with a high degree of comfort, but the comfort is not the immediate thing in the eye of the apostle. It says, I have not seen. This is the same as saying that no one had ever fully perceived and understood the value and beauty of those things which God has prepared for his people. All the world had been strangers to this until God made a revelation to his people by his spirit. The blessedness which the apostle referred to had been unknown alike to the Jews and Gentiles. Nor ear heard. We learn the existence and quality of objects by the external senses. And those senses are used to denote any acquisition of knowledge. To say that the eye had not seen nor the ear heard was therefore the same as saying that it was not known at all. All people had been ignorant of it. Neither have entered into the heart of man. No man has conceived it or understood it. It is new and is above all that man has seen and felt and known. The things which God had prepared. The things which God has held in reserve, that is what God has appointed in the gospel for his people. The thing to which the apostle here refers particularly is the wisdom which was revealed in the gospel, but he also intends doubtless to include all the provisions of mercy and happiness which the gospel makes known to the people of God. Those things relate to the pardon of sin, to the atonement, and to justification by faith, to the peace of and joy which religion imparts to the complete and final redemption from sin and death which the gospel is suited to produce and which it will ultimately affect in all these respects the blessings which the gospel confers surpass the full comprehension of people and are infinitely beyond all that man could know or experience without the religion of Christ and if on earth the gospel confers such blessings blessings on his friends how much higher and purer shall the joys which it shall bestow in heaven. Amen. So this is one of the second verses where I think that there was some confusion because, you know, the first one was where Paul said that he came in weakness and fear and trembling and people try to take that literally and physically. And, you know, here we have, you know, no eye hath seen or ear, or, yeah, no eye hath seen or ear heard the things that God prepared for them think that it's speaking of the future state, but it's not. It's speaking of, um, you know, the blessings that Christians have from believing in the gospel. And, you know, these things were previously unknown until, until that point. So, uh, you know, that verse is applicable to heaven, but it'd be taken out of context to say that, you know, that's exactly what's being spoken of. It's not. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 says, But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. This is another interesting verse. This verse commences the third part of this chapter, in which the Apostle shows how these truths so full of wisdom had been communicated to Christians. It had not been by any native endowments of theirs, not by any strength of faculties or powers, but solely by revelation from God but God hath revealed them. That is, those elevated views and enjoyments to which people uh, everywhere else had been strangers 
and which had been under all other forms of religion unknown, have been communicated to us by the revelation of God. Unto us, that is, first to the apostles, secondly to all Christians, to the church and the world through their inspired instructors, and third to all Christians by the illuminating agency of the Spirit on their hearts. The connection shows that he did not mean to confine this declaration to the apostles merely for his design was to show that all Christians had this knowledge of the true wisdom, and it was true that this was revealed in an imminent manner to the apostles and through their inspired preaching and writings, but it is also true that the same truths are communicated by the agency of the same Spirit to all Christians, John chapter 16, verse 12 through 14. No truth is now communicated to Christians which is not which was not revealed to and by the inspired writers, but the same truths are imparted by means of their writing and by illumination of the Spirit to all the true friends of God. And by His Spirit, we're speaking of the Holy Spirit. Uh, people by nature are not able to discover the deep things of God, the truths which are needful to salvation, and uh, that is within ourselves apart from the Holy Spirit. Um, you know, the Spirit illuminates us, and once we receive the Spirit, we come to a better understanding. So, um, the apostles were inspired by the Holy Spirit, and if so, then the Scriptures are inspired. So these are some points um, we can get from this. And also, all Christians are subjects to of the teaching of the Holy Spirit, that these truths are made known to them by His illumination, and that but for this they would remain in the same darkness as other men. And it talks about how the Spirit searcheth. Here it means that the Holy Spirit has an intimate knowledge of all things. It is not to be supposed that he searches or inquires as people do who are ignorant, but that he has an intimate and profound knowledge, such as is usually the result of a close and accurate search. The result is what the Apostle means to state, the accurate, profound, and thorough knowledge, such as usually attends research. He does not state the mode in which it is obtained, but the fact. And he uses a word more emphatic than simple knowledge because he designs to indicate that his knowledge is profound, entire, and thorough. All things, all subjects, all laws, all events, all beings, the deep things of God. He has a thorough knowledge of the hidden counsels and purposes of God. Of all his plans and purposes, he sees all his designs, he sees all his counsels, all his purposes in regard to the government of the universe and the scheme of salvation. He knows all whom God designs to save. He sees all that they need. And he sees how the plan of God is suited to their salvation. Okay. That sounds a little bit Calvinistic almost, but we'll just <laughs> say uh, not in the way that Calvinists would explain that. So I don't know about that one. Anyways, this passage proves that the Spirit is in some respects distinct from the Father, or from him who is here called God. Else, how could he be said to search all things, even the deep purposes of God? To search implies action, thought, personality. An attribute of God cannot be said to search, saying that the Holy Spirit isn't just an attribute of God. It's, it's a person. Um, how could it be said of the justice, the goodness, the power, or the wisdom of God that it searches or acts. To search as the action of an intelligent agent cannot be performed by an attribute. So we see that the Holy Spirit is a person, and yet that person is distinct from the Father. We also see that the Holy Spirit is omniscient. He searches or clearly understands all things. The very definition of omniscience, he understands all the profound plans and counsels of God, and how can there be a higher demonstration of omniscience than to know God? But if omniscient, the Holy Spirit is divine, for this is one of the incommunicable, incommunicable attributes of God. We see in First Chronicles 28 verse 9, Psalm 139, 1, Jeremiah 17:10. Also, he is not a distinct being from God. There is a union between him and God, such as may be compared to the union between man and his soul. 
1 Corinthians 2.11, God is one, and though he subsists as Father, Son, and Spirit, yet he is one God. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. This passage is therefore a very important and decisive one in regard to the personality and divinity of the Holy Spirit. And so, um, so we read later, well, in the next verse, uh, Now there's kind of a comparison between, you know, the spirit of a man or the soul of a man and the man himself and then, you know, the spirit of God and God himself. But I've said that I don't really like the comparison of, um, you know, people using this. They use the, the, the trichotomy view, which I've debunked, and, you know, the Bible teaches that man has two parts, a material part and an immaterial part, a body and then a soul. But anyways, people use the trichotomous view where they say body, soul, and spirit. They say man has three parts, and then they try to compare that to the Trinity. And, you know, Brian Denlinger and some others have taken that to an extreme. And uh, anyway, you know, there's a comparison here uh, in some regard, but, you know, not as... But there's, there's uh, differences and distinctions with this comparison too, and you know, I could go into more detail about that, but anyways, I think that verse is very awesome, that's one of the main big verses, I would say, out of this, uh, God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit, for the spirit searcheth all things, the deep things of God, we learn a lot about the Holy Spirit in that one, and, you know, the omniscience of, of God and the Holy Spirit, and that the Holy Spirit is a person, and you know, it's really interesting how we use these, um, there's these words that are used of persons like searching and um, you know it doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit is searching trying to find stuff because he he doesn't know things or because he's ignorant or unlearned um, but it's used to explain that he has such a thorough knowledge you know as someone who would search you know for these things diligently and, you know, that's very, very interesting to me. Um, again, you know, how we can use words to try to understand God. There's words and things that are said of God in Scripture that are help us to understand with our human knowledge. And But when you think deeper about it and stuff, it surpasses, you know, what we could fathom about God. And Just very fascinating. Anyways... Let's continue on to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 11. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. So we here we have the essential idea is that no man can know another, that his thoughts and designs can only be known by himself or by his own spirit, and that unless he chooses to reveal them to others, they cannot ascertain them. So of God. No man can penetrate his designs, and unless he chooses to make them known by his spirit, they must forever remain inscrutable to human view. The things of a man, we're talking about the deep things, the hidden counsels, the thoughts, the plans, the intentions, save the spirit of man, which means accept his own mind, or that is himself. By the spirit of man here, Paul denotes, uh, designs to denote the human soul, or the immaterial part, the intellect of man. Okay. Uh, it is not to be supposed that he here intends to convey the idea that there is a perfect resemblance between the relation which the soul of man bears to the man and the relation which the Holy Spirit bears to God. The Spirit of God can communicate his plans and deep designs just as a man can communicate his own intentions. And consequently, that while there is a distinction of some kind between the Spirit of God and God, and as there is a distinction which makes it proper to say that man has an intelligent soul, yet there is such a profound and intimate knowledge of God by the Spirit that he must be equal with him, and such an intimate union that he can be called the Spirit of God and be one with God, as the human soul can be called the Spirit of man and be one with him. Even so... Uh, to the same extent, in the like manner, the things of God, his deep purposes and plans, knoweth no man. Man cannot search into them any more than one man can searcheth the intentions of another. 
Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Now we have received, the Christians, the apostles, not the spirit of the world, not the wisdom and knowledge which the world can give, uh, but the spirit which is of God. We are under the teachings and influence of the Holy Spirit that we might know, that we might fully understand and appreciate. The Spirit is given to us in order that we might fully understand the favors which God has conferred on us in the gospel. It is not only necessary that God should grant the blessings of redemption by the gift of his Son, but such was the hardness and blindness of the human heart. It was needful to show, or it was needful that he should grant his Holy Spirit also, so that people might be fully brought fully to see and appreciate the value of those favors. For people do not see them by nature, neither does anyone see them who is not enlightened by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. The things which are freely given to us, the things that are conferred on us as a matter of grace or favor. Here refers to the blessings of redemption, the pardon of sin, justification, sanctification, the divine favor and protection, and the hope of eternal life. These things we know. They are not matters of conjecture but are surely and certainly confirmed to us by the Holy Spirit. It is possible for all Christians to know and to be fully assured of the truth of those things and of their interest in them. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. The things that we speak, which great and glorious and certain truths we, the apostles, preach and explain, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, not such as human philosophy or eloquence would dictate. They do not have their origin in the devices of human wisdom. They are not expressed in such words of dazzling and attractive rhetoric as would be employed by those who pride themselves on the wisdom of this world, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. And again, we have, you know, the Holy Ghost teaching. That's something that a person does. And so we see, you know, the... Uh, personality of the Holy Spirit. The, the Holy Spirit is a person. He is a person distinct from the Father. And if the Holy Ghost is divine, um, knowing the deep things of God, only God could. But so, continuing on, it says, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, that is, in the words which the Holy Ghost imparts to us, the Apostle is speaking of the whole course of instructions by which the deep things of God were made known to the Christian church, and all this was not made known in the very words which were already contained in the Old Testament. He evidently refers to the fact that the Apostles were themselves under the direction of the Holy Spirit in the words and doctrines which they imparted, and this passage is a full proof that they laid claim to divine inspiration. It is further observable that he says that this was done in such words as the Holy Spirit taught, referring not to the doctrines or subjects merely, but to the manner of expressing them. It is evident here that he lays claim to an inspiration in regard to the words which he used, or to the manner of his stating the doctrines of revelation. Words are the signs of thoughts, and if God designed that his truth should be accurately expressed in human language, there must have been a supervision over the words used that such should be employed, and such only, as should accurately express the sense which he intended to convey. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual, explaining doctrines that pertain to the Spirit's teachings and influence and words that are taught by the same Spirit, that are suited, and that are suited to convey in the most intelligible manner the doctrines to men. Okay, we'll continue on to the next one, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. A huge Calvinist proof text here. It says, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, can't know them, neither can he know them. He says they can't know them. The Calvinist says that the natural man here is the reprobate, it's the person who God has deemed um, before the world was created that was going to burn in hell no matter what. They had no option of repentance. They can't know the things of the Spirit of God. They can't repent is what the Calvinists claim. They can't believe in the gospel uh, because God made them that way and God just made them solely to burn in hell. Uh, that's not what this verse teaches. Let's continue on here. 
He receives not the things of God because he rejects them. You see, that is what we need to get to the bottom of here. It says that the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. And the Calvinist says that he, you know, it, the question is how or why can't he receive these things? And so the Calvinist says it's because God ordained that he could not receive them, which makes God to be evil. And so, but what the Bible says is that they cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God because they reject them. He cannot know them, meaning he cannot truly appreciate them because he rejects them. This statement does not deny that he has the free will to repent and receive the things of God and therefore to know them. But the natural man, the word natural here stands opposed evidently to spiritual in verse 15. It denotes those who are governed and influenced by the natural instincts in opposition to those who are influenced by the Spirit of God. It refers to unregenerate people. The word is used to denote that which man has in common with the brutes, to denote that they are under the influence of the senses in opposition to reason and conscience. Receiveth not, it does not embrace or comprehend them. That is, he rejects them as folly. He does not perceive their beauty or their wisdom. He despises them. He loves other things better. A man of intemperance does not receive or love the arguments for temperance. A man of licentiousness, the arguments for chastity, a liar, the arguments for truth. So a sensual or worldly man does not receive the love or love the arguments for religion. The things of the Spirit of God. The doctrines which are inspired by the Holy Spirit and the things which pertain to his influence on the heart of life. The things of the Spirit of God here denote all the things which the Holy Spirit produces. Neither can he know them, neither can he understand or comprehend them. Again, why? Because he rejects them. The passage here proves that while man is thus sensual, the things of the Spirit will appear to him to be folly. It proves nothing about his ability or his natural faculty, to see the excellency of these things and to turn from his sin. It is the affirmation of a simple fact everywhere discernible, that the natural man does not perceive the beauty of these things, that while he remains in the state he cannot, and that if he is ever brought to perceive their beauty, it will be by the influence of the Holy Spirit, such is his love of sin, that he never will be brought to see their beauty except by the agency of the Holy Spirit. They are spiritually discerned. That is, they, the Spirit, the things of the Spirit of God, are perceived by the aid of the Holy Spirit, enlightening the mind and influencing the heart. Meaning, because uh, you know they're in their natural state and they're rejecting uh, the truths of God, um, they can only uh, come to appreciate them and understand them with the illumination of the Holy Spirit. So. That's a very big verse, I think a very big important one there, and uh, understanding the correct interpretation of that verse is important. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, Again, just going back, you know, because I think this was from Albert Barnes and reading that previous verse, you know, with the point to where he says that this verse proves nothing about his abilities. That makes me say, you know, that he's not a Calvinist if he's pointing that out. Anyways, verse 15, but he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he is judged of no man. This is a big verse a lot of people use. He that is spiritual, primarily referring to himself as an affirmation of the authority he was about to exercise in correcting the disorders of Corinth. So, speaking of Paul, or any Christian, uh, but all things, that is, of this nature, of the mysteries of God, which concern man's eternal life and salvation. Not that every good Christian hath such perfect judgment or power of discerning, but according to the measure of illumination which he hath received. Okay. Um, so, judging all, all things, we're talking about spiritual things, the things of the Spirit of God. Uh, but he is judged of no man. The, wor the world does judge the Christian. It does make a judgment about him. 
What is meant is, they who are not enlightened by the Holy Ghost do not judge correctly concerning him. He acts from principles that which they are unacquainted. His character and motives are not appreciated or understood by mankind in general. The Spirit from God is not to be judged by the Spirit of the world. For God is right and the world is wrong. So I think there might be kind of some misunderstandings of that, that you know, the spiritual man is judged by no one, by no man. Yeah, we are judged by the world, but incorrectly. Uh, they don't understand, uh, you know, the things that we do being illuminated by the Spirit. So, verse 16, uh, which is the final verse. And for who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. Paul again cited Isaiah, Isaiah 40, 13, and... Um, we see him also saying this in Romans 11:34, Isaiah 40:13 and 14. Who hath directed the spirit of the Lord, or being his counselor, hath taught him? With whom took he counsel, and who instructed him, and taught him in the path of judgment, and taught him knowledge, and showed him the way of understanding? In Romans chapter 11, verse 34, we read, "For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor?" Um, the the prophet marveled at the mind of God who can fully understand what God understands certainly no one can on the other hand mature believers can understand to a much greater degree than unbelievers because they have the spirit of God in them and he controls them consequently the mature Christian has the mind of Christ he or she views life to some extent as Jesus did because that person understands things from God's perspective at least partially in his epistle to the Philippians Paul urged his readers readers to adopt the mind of Christ. Philippians 2 verse 5. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Even though we have the mind of Christ we need to adopt it, to use it, to view life as he did. One evidence of Christian maturity is the believer's consistent employment of Christ's attitude and viewpoint in all of life. So here's a conclusion or a summary of the whole of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Um, you see, in this section, the last section that we read, or, you know, the second half, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6 through 16, Paul elaborated on the subject of the Holy Spirit's ministry of illuminating the believer about what God has revealed. He had previously reminded his readers that he had conducted himself in their midst with the supernatural viewpoint in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 through 5, at the beginning of the chapter. The basic theological point of tension between Paul and the Corinthians in this epistle was over what it means to be a spirit person. Because of their experience of speaking in tongues, they considered themselves to be as the angels and in need only of shedding their bodies. The sources of this distorted view were, pro were popular philosophy tainted with Hellenistic dualism. Hellenistic dualism viewed anything material as evil and anything non-material as spiritual or good. The result was a spirituality or higher wisdom that had little connection with ethical behavior. The concern from here on will be to force them to acknowledge the folly of their wisdom of Solomon, which is expressing itself in quarrels and thereby destroying the very church for which Christ died. So a lot of good stuff here, a lot of proofs of the deity of Christ, uh, some understanding of the Holy Spirit, some, you know, um, verses that Calvinism takes. Calvinists take out of context. Um, so I learned a lot from studying this chapter, and I hope that you learn a lot from this as well. Thank you for watching, and God bless.